from TQIP 2017, Drama Program Manager Tracy Johns from Navison Health explains how hemodynamic ultrasound helped lower her CRRT rate by 30%. Here's Tracy Johns. So we're talking about hemodynamic ultrasound, um, just a little bit about our hospital. We're a 535 bed hospital. We're located in the middle of Georgia. We're one of five level one trauma centers in the state. Um, and we see the last, last year we saw 3,600 trauma patients. Okay, Dr. Ashley talked a little bit about what hemodynamic ultrasound actually is, and he gave us a few cases to look at. Well, what is its practical application at the bedside, patient by patient? What I'm gonna talk about is a little bit about what I've seen as a program manager with the ultrasound and how it's reduced the number of CRRT days by better management of our fluid status. Also, what we've seen with organ donation and patient management there, and also how it's coming around to help us in PI and in trending on a bigger um, way with our patients. I'm a trauma program manager, so I think trauma program managers and really PI coordinators to a certain extent are hall monitors. We're looking at this population, they're coming and going, and we're really focused on two things, process and outcomes. And we're getting a lot of that, listening to the TQIP talks and finding out about these outcomes, where we should be, where we are. And so one of the complications that we all follow is AKI. So as I'm looking at the data, I've noticed a couple of trends in the last couple of years. Number one, our trauma volume has increased. And this has happened to a lot of Georgia hospitals. We've seen an eight to 10% increase in our trauma patient volume over the last three years. But also we have seen the AKI rate trend down since 2012, and the CRRT use. So how can that be? So I'm thinking, well, what's going on? So I hear them talking about this HTEE, or the hemodynamic ultrasound, so I'm thinking, well, how does this affect it? Well, we had a study that was conducted, and what they wanted to do was say, CRT use, how is it affected? So they looked at patients and matched them before and after using HTEE to look at the volume status. So the patients were looked at from 2009 to 2015 at our trauma center, and they were all admitted to the ICU. In this graph, what we're looking at is each year represented by a blue bar. The number of patients that did not receive CRRT are in blue, and the number is at the bottom of the bar. The number at the top of the bar is the number of trauma patients that receive CRRT. That could be anywhere from one day to sometimes as many as 30 days. Um, you've got the orange line that's showing you before and after HTE use, but what's really impressive to me is it's this gray line. That's the percentage of patients. So even though the numbers might be going up a little bit in the after group, that was 15 patients, there's 24 before, but it's really a much lower percentage because our volume is higher, our denominator is higher, and also our number has dropped. So as a trauma program manager, I'm excited to see this kind of trend because I'm thinking, well, CRRT, to me in my head, goes along with AKI, and that means good. There's fewer complications to AKI. Um, our trauma program, I mean, our um, STICU director, our trauma ICU um, nurse manager likes this because she does not like to see a lot of CRRT use because to her, that this is her staffing up. Because our CRRT patients have to be one-on-one. -on -one. So when you start doing that and you're already tight on your staffing, you know, then you're scrambling to look for more staffing. So this is really exciting to her, but in a different way. I'm gonna skip, well, I'll show you this slide, but I noticed 0.5% of our patients were getting CRRT. Afterwards, 0.2% of our patients are getting CRRT, which is a pretty big difference. We've dropped almost 30% in the number, you know, it's a two-fold decrease in the patients that are getting to a point they have to have CRRT, which is a good thing all around because you're looking at length of stay, ICU length of stay, costs, staffing, it's a lot of stuff, and it's a good um, trend to see. So as a program manager, you've got the research study conclusions, and this is the way I look at it. Well, our faculty staffing was stable during this time. We really didn't have any population changes except for the one I mentioned where our volume has gone up, and with that, our ISS scores are trending up. But also, the only practice change I can think about, well, we did start MTP, and that was about the same time that we started using HTEE. So, mm, is there some influence there on this study? Who knows? But we did know from this study that there was a very strong association. You can't say cause and effect because there are a lot of variables that can uh, contribute to um, AKI and CRRT use, but there was a very strong association and we saw a big drop in the CRT, the CRRT use as we started using hemodynamic ultrasound on a more regular basis. Um, I put the AKI in there because when I think CRRT, I think of AKI and I think of TV. Where am I on the graph? <clears throat> but we talked about MTP, so did that have some influence on the study? Well, one of um, our, um, the ICU director, co-director, Dr. Amy Christie wanted to take a look at this. So what she did is she said, 
is patient resuscitation or volume status, how is that influenced by MTP? <clears throat> so she looked at some patients who came in with hemorrhagic shock from either blunt or penetrating trauma, they received MTP, their ED dispo was too high CU, and she used some metrics that Dr. Ashley has mentioned as far as the kissing part, whether it was the superior being came over the left ventricle, they named some numbers and said, if, you know, you're at this or below, then you're under resuscitated. <clears throat> So what we found, we did not have a lot of patients, but what we found is 10 out of 12 of these patients were under-resuscitated, which was really kind of surprising, because you're thinking, you know, blood products stay in the intravascular system a lot better, and so you're thinking, you know, that's a much better volume of resuscitation, but we still were not meeting the rate. And then also, five out of 12 of those patients had a pretty significant secondary volume status change. So as Dr. Ashley had mentioned in one of his patients, you know, sometimes they're changing, you've got that HTEE probe there, then you can say, okay, what's going on? And then also, do I need to rescan or consider something else that's going on with the patient? So in conclusion, um, what we found out is that MTP, with the MTP, under resuscitation was not uncommon. So, okay, my trauma program, all monitor thing says, I need to look at MTP a little bit closer. Um, but that HTEE did help us identify changes quickly or look at what was going on. And also, for me, it kind of settled in my mind that MTP probably did not have a significant influence on our CRRT study because we were under-resuscitating, so it's not you know, going to be that significant of an influence. So another way that we've used hemodynamic ultrasound and looked at it is optimizing organ management. <clears throat> in our patient, one, uh, in our hospital, when a patient is identified as an organ donor, they're consented, and most of the ones that we deal with in trauma or uh, from traumatic brain injury, um, the organ procurement agency, which in Georgia is like Lincoln, Georgia, they take over management of the patient. So from the time of brain death to procurement, LifeLink is managing that patient, and their primary objective is organ optimization, which is a nice word, but in Dr. Ashley's language, you've got happy, juicy organs. So you want happy, juicy organs to transplant to the people who need them. So what we did is we looked at taking hemodynamic ultrasound and thought, well, how does it affect the management and the organs, you know, as far as the number of organs and, you know, the numbers that could be transplanted. So we looked at patients 18 years old or older that had been declared brain dead, and we got 10 consecutive or 10 consented donors. That's a pretty small number. But in these donors, what we did is at the time of brain death, we started doing, doing serial HTEE measurements. So the hemodynamic ultrasound, we're looking at their volume every five hours from the time of brain death to the time that they went for organ donation or procurement. Um, then we took a group of patients and we matched those consented donors that got the hemodynamic ultrasound and we matched them for injury and age to do a comparison to see the outcomes and how they compared. And this is what we found. So you see the HTE group in the left column. The right is the control group. You see their mechanism of injuries pretty much match, age, male, female. What is uh, really impressive and uh, pretty shocking, but vasopressor use went down 80%. Um, and then also the organ donation uh, per donor went up 4.1 to 3.8, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is 8%. It's trending favorably, and that's only in 10 patients. So it really gives you some hope in a way of better managing your organ donors. Um, as a trauma program manager, I am interested in the number of organs recovered and also organs transplanted. Part of that is also because I'm on our organ donation team, so when we are surveyed by CMS or DMV, I'm part of that group that talks to them, and those are two numbers that they're really looking at, and they're looking at them hard. So um, that really is a good thing, too. And so when they ask, well, what are you doing? I can whip out the study. This is what we're doing. We're looking at that. So we've seen um, hemodynamic ultrasound in, as far as volume status, managing it, and it's affected the AKI, how it's, we've evaluated our MTP, also our organ management. So what does this mean to me? Okay, so I'm going to put on that HTE hall monitor trauma program hat. And it's a party hat because we all know being a program manager is a big party. Uh, sometimes we want to shoot ourselves before the party and sometimes it's after, but no. So we put on our hat. And really I'm seeing this as a team effort. It's been pretty effective and it's influenced a lot of things as far as my trauma population. My AKI, AKI rate has been flat, observed to have uh, expected around 1 to 1.1% or the observed to expected over two years, that's with increased volume and increased ISS, which really is pretty good. Um, this also plays into the fact we've got a Georgia Collaborative. We play very well together in the sandbox. Um, we are taking a look at a state in a statewide manner at 
um, AKI. We run our data, all 15 level one and two centers pull their data, and it's run as one. So that way we have a state benchmark. So we look at, as, as a state, where do we have an opportunity for improvement? And one of the places we've identified two, VAP, and we're looking at AKI. So here this is kind of playing into with the hemodynamic ultrasound. I'm kind of seeing flat, but we've got other centers that are seeing positive and negatives. So this might be something that can play into treatment or best practice for AKI. We don't know yet, but we're looking into it. So it is an opportunity for improvement for the trauma hospital. So all 15 level one and two trauma centers have done a deep dive and looked at one year of their AKI patients, and we looked at a lot of stuff. Um, but also on the NISPRIP side, AKI has been identified as an outlier and an opportunity for improvement. So we're trying to work together, and because they also are surgery patients, and we're looking at this together to see are there similarities where we can share best practice or things to um, prevent AKI from happening. So it really helps in our collaborative efforts. So keeping my home monitor party hat on, the other things I'm seeing is my hospital and ICU length of stay is staying flat. It's right at the median for both reports, 2016, 2017, in ICU and the hospital. Um, is this all from hemodynamic monitoring? No, but I think it surely has helped it, especially with cutting down on my CRRT days. Um, also, we've got improved organ donation management, and that is something that the college looks at, and it's also something that CMS looks at, and it's also something that DMV looks at, or Joint Commission, whoever surveys you. So, um, at the bedside, Dr. Ashley's looking at hemodynamic ultrasound and a patient-by-patient -patient basis. You know, they want to do, they want to manage it well. They want to get the patient better and get them on their way. I look at it in a population manner, a hall monitor. I'm looking at outcomes, and I, I've seen it touch a lot of different things that I have to monitor, and I've seen some really positive outcomes. So I really feel like we've got a pretty big bang for our buck out of the ultrasound, uh, hemodynamic ultrasound, and um, I'm actually pretty happy because it's done things for me and let me concentrate in other areas or show me other areas where I need to concentrate on. And I thank you very much.